The following interviews from other sources is with Dr. Hugh Ross. It provides some details about what life was like growing up autistic, but not yet being diagnosed. Dr. Ross is now a successful scientist in the field of astrophysics and founder and senior scholar at Reasons to Believe. Well, like most people on the autistic spectrum, I was verbally handicapped, apparently, mm -hmm. but it's apparent. My mother would say, yeah, Hugh only has three words. Mm -hmm. Yes, no, and cookie. <laughs> and you can get pretty far with those three <laughs> words. Three Cookie's words. good, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but what I learned was if I did speak, I would get into trouble because mm -hmm. people on the spectrum tend to be really blunt and honest. Mm -hmm. And so I got uh, reprimanded for saying, mm -hmm. Oh, look at that lady, she's really fat. Yeah. Or that man's really dirty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I basically said, if I'm gonna stay out of trouble, I gotta keep my mouth shut. Mm -hmm. Also, because I was quiet, mm -hmm. all of my parents' friends in Montreal, where I spent my first four years, insisted that I was uh, mentally handicapped mm -hmm. and that I needed to be put into an institution. Mm -hmm. My parents, I could, I could hear him saying, they defended me mm -hmm. and basically said, no, we've seen what he does. Mm -hmm. Have you ever watched him play? Mm -hmm. He's not mentally handicapped. But growing up in Vancouver, uh, I was in school, I wasn't speaking, mm -hmm. and also I had uh, dexterity problems. Mm -hmm. I couldn't make a pencil make numbers and letters. Mm -hmm. So in grade one, I was failing in all the subjects, mm -hmm. and I was looks like I was going to have to repeat grade one. Mm -hmm. uh, but six weeks before the end of the school year, our parents moved from a rented, small rented house into a condemned home that they were going to rebuild. So I had this grade one teacher, Lila Campbell, for just six weeks. Somehow she saw the frustration on my face and said, stay after school, I want to ask you some questions and she had about 30 books on her desk, mm -hmm. and she asked me questions about those books. She figured out that even though I wasn't speaking, uh, that I was reading. Mm -hmm. I'd read the books, I gave the correct answers. So she said, look, I know you're failing in all your subjects, but I'm gonna try to get you into grade two. Mm -hmm. So uh, she went to bat for me with the principal, wow. mm -hmm. and I got into grade two, mm -hmm. but here I am in grade two, and uh, at that time in Canada, your seating in the class depended on your academic standing. I was in the last chair. Hmm. And even though the teacher never made it clear, uh, all the students knew. Hmm. And so I got teased all the time for being the class hmm. dummy. Uh, but I said, okay, I'm gonna have to talk. Mm -hmm. No matter how much trouble I get into, I'm gonna start talking. Hmm. And between grade one and grade two, my parents said that I was obsessive. I was spending hours a day practicing how to make a pencil, mm. make numbers and letters. Mm. Mm. But when I entered grade two, I could make the pencil do what I needed it to do. Mm. And so there'd be a set of tests every few weeks. Mm -hmm. Every few weeks, I'd move up a few chairs. Mm. And by the end of grade two, I was in the first chair. Wow. Yeah. So mm. what I could say to parents mm. who have children on the spectrum, mm -hmm. they have a special gift. Mm. Help them find that gift. Mm. In my case, I kind of found it on my own. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to the library and sure. I said, oh, I just love physics and astronomy. Mm -hmm. And what I share with parents who have uh, children that are on the spectrum, expose them to material that's eight or nine grade levels above where they are and see what grabs their attention. Mm -hmm. And typically, you know, give them, say, freshman college texts. Mm -hmm. And the one thing you can do is kind of put lines around a paragraph that you know they're gonna be able to comprehend and see their eyes go to the more complicated material. Mm. That's your clue. And then if that's all they wanna study, and that's typical of people on the spectrum, they kind of kind of get locked in mm. to just one subject, then you can encourage that. Mm. So great, great advice. Wow. Mm -hmm. And then I suppose you chose to be proactive rather than reactive. I mean, you, you could have done, uh, done what a lot of kids on the spectrum do, is just basically retreat and, and, and form a shell and never come out. Well, I did some of that. My parents were worried that I just spent all my time in my room, and we had one book, and I was reading that one book. But when I was in grade two, our teacher took us to the public library, 
And so I would actually uh, borrow, you know, get bus fare from my parents. And every Saturday I would go to the Vancouver Public Library and come home with five books on astronomy and physics. So Really? Yeah. And every week I would read five books on, that, on those How subject matters. How at this point? I was seven. Seven, you're reading astronomy and physics? Correct. Did your parents clue in, this kid is brilliant? They, they told me they knew I was brilliant by the, from the time I was two years of age, because they said they watched me doing science experiments without any motivation starting at age two. At age two? At age two. And so they said, and I wasn't talking, but they said, we know something's going on there. A number of my friends are saying, Hugh, you need to consider the fact that you're either autistic or you've got Asperger's. And at first I said, no, nah, it can't be. You know, I, I don't see that. Uh, but, you know, I had enough people saying that to me, especially my wife said it to me. I said, you know what, I'm going to start taking the tests. And what I discovered is if you go online, there's like 16, 20 different tests you can take. So I decided to just take all the tests. Uh, but I also thought it would be important to have that confirmed. So I asked my friends and my wife to take those tests as if they were me. And so I want to make sure we were being objective mm -hmm. about this mm -hmm. because it would be Excellent. easy for me to read things in there. And so I looked at the way they would evaluate me on the tests and the way I evaluated myself on the tests. And it was encouraging that there was consensus. So I was, you know, I was trying to be careful not to allow my own personal biases get in the way. Uh, but the fact that uh, my friends and myself uh, all came up with the same conclusion, that I either had severe Asperger's or mild autism somewhere in that line. I'm William O'Flaherty. Thanks for visiting my channel. Please consider liking and or sharing this video. Also, feel free to comment and don't forget to subscribe to this channel and watch other videos.